Welcome to the open problem session. And I guess all of you have this book. Yes? So if you open page number 467, <laughs> there are lots of open problems. So, uh, and all of those are open problems in Curlin, and they have remained open for a long time. So, those are in some sense some torch bearer of open problems in parameterized complexity or in kernelization complexity, to be fair. So, let me just mention some of them for you here. And, uh, and then you can add to this growing list. Uh, so, just to be, we already have seen some open problems, so let me write down some for you. Uh, So first one is customary, so let me write it down. Directed feedback vertex set, okay? The first one, okay? This is why we gave you the book, you know? So it's easy to <laughs> check. So this problem is known to be FPT from 2007 onwards, but we do not know whether it admits a polynomial kernel or not, even on planar graph. Open, okay? So forget about even general graphs. We do not know whether it admits polynomial kernel even on planar graph. Okay. So you can read history about these problems a little bit uh, at the below of each of the open problems. And one problem was already mentioned in the talk by Eric about planar vertex relation. So you want to delete k vertices to get a planar graph. So now why it is important to open problem? Because uh, if you look at, so this is like first, so you can, you can define a problems like, like say, uh, what do you call? So what we defined was called planar f deletion. Now what is this problem? So you're given a fixed finite family f, fixed finite family of graph fixed of graphs and it contains one planar graph, okay? So for example, let's say F is an edge. So what you want is that you want to delete K vertices such that you do not get any graph in F as a minor. Okay, so now if you put F at just an edge, this is nothing but vertex covered. Okay, and if you take F as triangle, this is nothing but, so you do not want any cycle in your graph. So this corresponds to feedback vertex F, so FVS in undirected graph, and so on and so forth. So for this, we have a classical bus kernel and 2K vertex kernel, and for this, there was a very, it was also open in undirected graph whether FVS admits a polynomial kernel or not, and it was set a long time back, and then the current best known kernel has K square vertices, and S is actually. So, but uh, later it was generalized and shown that this problem admits a polynomial kernel with size K, some poly in family size, okay? But if you notice, this F contains at least one planar graph, right? Now, what about family which contains K3, three? This is not planar graph. Or F contains just K5, it's not planar graph, right? These are the two smallest non-planar graph we can think of, and we do, and any F, whether it contains planar or not, any F deletion is FPT by graph minors and all these kind of things. So whether they admit polynomial kernel or not is a natural open question. But we do not even know whether they admit open pro uh, polynomial kernel for one, for family which contains only one non-planar 
graph, like K33 or K5. So this is why, just to even make a good understanding whether all F deletion problem admits a polynomial kernel or not, we should try to understand at least a special cases of K33 or K5 or and K5, okay? And so this is nothing but K33 and K5. And as uh, it was shown by Eric that there's a reduction from planar vertex multi-way cut to planar vertex deletion. So maybe we can leverage some ideas from there to get a polynomial kernel, okay? So, so this is the second problem which I told you. So why, I just, I'm just giving you some idea where do they fit in and why they are listed here as an open problem because this has been open problem for a long time. And one thing which is quite intriguing to see that edge problems behave very differently, like edge deletion problem or edge completion problem behave very differently to vertex deletion problems. And one such problem, and there are many such problems, I will mention some. There's something called interval completion. So what is an interval completion? You're given a graph G and you are asked, can I add K non-edges and make a graph interval? So you can also have, say, for example, chordal completion. So I given a graph G, can I add K edges so the graph becomes chordal? So chordal completion has a polynomial kernel, like I think quadratic kernel, but sorry. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Okay, thanks. Father time, so I cannot help it, sorry. Okay, so interval completion. So given a graph G, you want to add K edges to make graph interval. So this is this was shown to be FPT in 2007. It has C power K algorithm X in? Uh, Oh, it has a sub-exponential algorithm, right? K root K, I forgot. But whether it admits a polynomial kernel, we do not know. We do not know. So this is one problem of edge. And this problem is not mentioned, but let me still mention it. I saw study is deleting K edges to get a claw-free graph. So what is claw? It is this. So you want to delete k so that you do not, your graph does not contain claw as an induced subgraph. So somehow this problem, we do not know whether it admits a polynomial kernel or not. And there was a paper by Exin about diamond. I'm going to talk about that on Thursday. Huh? Okay. And you had a paper with diamond and and, and claw. Kate claw, but whether this this problem is what you call uh, deleting cases to get a claw free graph, and here by claw free graph I mean in, induce as an induced graph, not as a subgraph. We still do not know whether it admits a polynomial kernel or not, and it's a good open problem. So this is what I meant by if you had deleting k vertices, then it has a trivially k to the power four kernel using sunflower lemma or some such thing. But when you just get to edge, they start to behave very differently. For example. I know for sure that if you had, if you wanted a graph without induced C4, it does not admit a polynomial kernel. So they start to behave very differently in terms of edge relation. Uh, okay. For this problem, for adding k edges or editing k edges, are both open. Yeah. So I uh, yeah even editing. You're right. So I just I just I stated. Adding, adding is really, really is really yeah. It's open. So by adding cages to get a claw-free graph or, or editing, all these are open for this problem, okay? So this is not mentioned here, but I still told you. Another open, interesting open problem is, so this was, uh, so suppose you're given a monotone sequence. You are given a permutation pi of numbers, and you are asked, suppose if you ask a question, is it a way, can I partition this sequence into k increasing sequence. You understand? k, like monotonically sequence. And you can show this problem is polytime. Or k decreasing sequence, it is still polytime. But if you wanted that given a pi and a number k, can I partition this pi into k monotonic sequence? It means either it could be increasing sequence or decreasing sequence. The problem is NP hard. And long time back, we showed that this problem 
does admit FPT algorithm with running time k square log k. Not writing polynomials here. But we do not know whether this problem admits a polynomial kernel or not. And there is a, a stabbing version of this where you are, think of this, you are given a disjoint axis parallel rectangles in a plane, and you are allowed to use either k horizontal lines or uh, vertical lines to intersect all these rectangles. So those both problems were shown to be FPTY similar methods, and both for which we do not know whether they admit polynomial kernel or not. It has. It is basically partitioning a permutation graph into either k, uh, either clicks or independent sets. Co-coloring. Co okay. Okay. Already there was a mentioned open problem of vertex multi bay cut. So. For this vertex multi bay cut, there's something called deletable version where terminals are allowed to be deleted. That deletable version, it has, I think, k square kernel. Okay, I don't remember, but it does have a uh, polynomial kernel for if you're allowed to delete terminals. But when terminals are not allowed to be deleted, delete, all we know that we have a kernel of size terminal times plus one. And today, Eric told us that on planar graphs, even this has a kernel without dependence on terminals. And this is also uh, randomized, OK? So this is open on general graph, OK? And there's another interesting problem, which probably I should mention to you, is it's quite interesting. is a T-cycle problem. So what is a T-cycle problem? So it's very interesting that you're given a terminal T and a graph G, and you're asking a question, does there exist a cycle passing through T, and your parameter is size of T? So this problem does admit a compression, which means a uh, I can, like in polynomial time, I can convert it into an instance of some other problem, okay, of polynomial size. But we do not know whether it admits a polynomial kernel or not. So it admits compression. But whether poly kernel or not, we do not know. Now, generally the trick has been that if you reduce to a problem which is inside NP, then you can give a reduction. But unfortunately, this problem doesn't seem, the problem to which we reduce does not seem to be in NP. So what it also tells us something very interesting that in kernelization, we can actually go to something way, maybe way more harder problem than what we started and compress it into small. But the only known example we, have, we are aware of is this. So whether, so whether this will define a separation between admitting a kernelization versus compression, we do not know. So we do not know whether there exists a problem for which there is compression, but there is no kernel, or there, you, you understand, right? So maybe this is the first problem which probably could show such, or maybe we can get a real polynomial kernel for this problem. Does it have a name? Yeah, it is called a T-cycle problem. So it is the last problem in the book. So except those clawfury thing, all I'm telling you from the book. The original name was K cycle. Right? Exactly, but but K cycle and K cycle they seems very similar. So, okay, so so uh, there are some very interesting problems. Let's see. So the reason I'm reading out all these open problems to you, just to tell you that the field is not dead. Which people have been complaining that, are there some something interesting to do? Yes, there are lots of interesting things to do. It's just that, so if you have done a parameterized complexity, then the one thing we do learn all the time is vertex cover has a kernel of size 
2k vertices. Okay, but size-wise, we know that it cannot be done better than so. You cannot have k to the power two minus epsilon size kernel. Okay. Modulo ETH. Ah, uh, no, Mike. Modulo co NP is contained inside NP slash poly. Okay, so. Whether there is a smaller than 2k kernel for planar graph. Yes, yes, I'm coming, coming, coming. So, open problem. Show that 1.99k kernel for vertex cover is not possible. And maybe on planar graph, we can get maybe 1 plus epsilon k size vertex kernel, and maybe your running time could be f of epsilon times n, or maybe n to the power f of epsilon. I have no idea. Right? So he's right. So we do not know whether for vertex cover we can get bound better than 2k, right? This. But look, you cannot get, say, for example, I cannot get uh, k to the power 1 minus epsilon size kernel. This, is, this will follow from slightly from here, because if you had this, then you will get a kernel with a small number of a small size. So we do not hope to have a kernel with this. But why not 1.99k kernel on planar graphs or on or on general graph? I mean, or any graph family for that matter, where the problem is NP hat. Actually, I don't know. We know this for vertex cover on planar graph. What? 1.99k kernel? Yes. A lower bound, you mean? A lower bound. But we do not know upper bound. Yes. Better than two. Yes. And also the lower bound is for kernel of a kind in the following sense that it cannot be induced sub. Like when we say that the kernel has to be an induced subgraph of the graph. Yes, something like that, yes. Hmm. Right? So in the, because the current kernel is like you delete vertices and what you have is an induced subgraph of the given graph. So in that setting, you're right, there's a lower bound that unless p is not equal to np, we cannot have a kernel of size 1.33k, even on planar graph. Okay, but we do not know anything about, so he's right, so maybe this question is irrelevant, this is what he's saying. He says, but 2 minus epsilon k kernel, even for planar graph, is a good open question. Or in fact, yes, Daniel? You have to make sure that it does not preserve uh, answers, or at least does not preserve approximate solutions. Right? Uh, for well, here. 99 k kernel. Because let's say, I mean, no, no, for, for for general. Graphs. Okay. Because you, I mean, it's it's unique games hard to yeah. approximate where two minus below yeah. factor two. Yes. Right. So in particular, it means that if I have a 1.99 k kernel for vertex cover. Picking the entire vertex set in the kernelized solution should not give you two approximations of the original instance. Okay, so, but these kind of questions about uh, elements is not limited to vertex cover. For example, as I was telling you before, that feedback vertex set has a kernel with k squared vertices. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 So that implies a lossy kernel of size one plus epsilon k. Yes. Okay. Or even constant size. Yeah, constant size. Yes, that's true. Okay. So. So I was just telling you, right, I mean, these kind of questions, we can not only ask about vertex cover, but about almost many problems which are very basic and we do not know answer to this. For example, let's say feedback vertex set on undirected graph. It has k square vertices and k square edges. What prevents us, is there a way to show that k square, like we cannot get k to the power 2 minus epsilon vertices, or it is possible to get k to the power 2 minus epsilon vertices kernel for FVS. 
Okay. Another question, interesting question is simple question like deheating set. Like so, deheating set you are given a universe and sets of size d, and you want to intersect with k elements all the sets. And for this, there is a kernel with k power d minus one elements and k power d sets. And it is known that you cannot get k to the power d minus epsilon size kernel. But what prevents us from getting a kernel with, say, order k elements? Or we can prove some sort of lower bound that we need some k to the power, some growing function of d as a lower bound, like any function of d as a lower bound. We do not know any methodology to show this. But, uh, uh, but not only this, like d heating set, so this is what we did a couple of years back, is that we said, okay, fine, for d heating set, we cannot do anything, but let's look at feedback vertex set in tournaments, or cluster vertex deletion set, or you can come up with many implicit d heating set problems, right? And for feedback vertex set in tournament, with lots of hard work, we were able to get a kernel with k to the power 2 minus epsilon here also. But maybe for these things, we can get an order k size vertex kernel. We don't know. So if we are not able to make progress here, maybe we should make progress on some of the well-studied kernelization problems and see. And my own belief is that for at least these problems, there is a linear vertex kernel. It's just that we don't know how to show, at least. At least this is my personal belief that they have. It's just that we have not found right technique to do this. Okay, so uh, this is about uh, some, and you can ask such kind of questions about elements and this on many many problems which is there in this textbook, like edge dominating set and this and that. So I'm not going to mention those. But all I was trying to tell you that these are the class of questions which also we can consider and which we do not know. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about. So after, till 2010, almost all the kernels we had were deterministic. But in 2011 or 12, there was a technique of representative sets introduced by Crouch and Wallström. And that started to yield us lots of interesting kernels, but they all were randomized. Okay, so the one more direction that people have, one more direction that now seems important is deterministic kernels for problems such as OCT, odd cycle transversal, uh, almost too sad, above guarantee vertex cover or LP, whatever you want to say and say subset feedback vertex set. So all these problems has a polynomial kernel, but randomized polynomial kernel. But the question is, do we have deterministic kernel for these problems? these problems, right? So you saw one today for OCT that at least on planar graphs we can get a deterministic kernel. But what about these and many other problems for which we have got a randomized kernel now using the method. So the reason why all these kernels are randomized is because there's an object called gammaoids for which the only known representations, only known representations are randomized. So if someone de-randomizes this step, automatically all these kernels will become deterministic. So, but maybe this may be a much harder question than maybe going to going and exploiting structure of these problems, but because this has also connections to other set of things in complexity and algorithms, but the reason why all these are randomized is because there's something called object called metroid, called gammaoids, and there's something called representation of metroids, which is basically representing this object as a matrix, and if you wanted to have 
uh, independent set queries, you just go to the corresponding set of columns in your matrix and check whether they, they are independent or not. So if someone in polynomial time come up with a representation for gamma h, which is deterministic, you will get deterministic kernel for all these problems. So, okay. So, so I told you a little bit about deterministic kernels. And you will hear a talk from Mihao about Turing kernels. So let me mention what is Turing kernels. Okay. So there's something good. So there are problems for which we can show that in polynomial time, uh, we cannot come up with a kernel. But maybe in polynomial time, I can come up with uh, not one instances, several instances, several instances of the problem, each small size. And uh, you have a yes instance, if and only some way of some way of you know using these kernels you can get an answer to your your original question so you can imagine that you have an oracle that takes a uh, input or of the like instances of this object of poly k size and tells you yes or no based on whether this is a yes instance or no instance and you have to solve your problem by using this oracle polynomially many times but the only constraint is that it can take instances of poly k size. It cannot take anything. So this is like a very general frame of Turing kernels. And the best known open problem is uh, for what is that called k path or longest path. So you're given a graph g, an integer k, and you are asked a question, does there exist a path of length k? So this problem does not have a poly kernel. It does admit a Turing kernel on planar graphs and up to h minor free graphs. But whether it admits a uh, such a kernel on general graphs is still open, and it has link to a complexity of, for the complexity theory which was built for kernelization problem WK1 or WK2, and we do not know whether this problem is, if this problem would have been complete for WK1, then uh, in some sense it's an evidence to show that it cannot have such a kernel, so either showing that it is complete for WK1, whatever that object means, or getting such kind of kernel for longest path, it's still a good open problem. So. More or less, I've given you certain directions in which one can look for uh, open questions. And now I invite all of you to come one by one and please tell your favorite open problems. So what I told you is the favorite open problems which is listed in the book. Good question. Uh, this k pass problem on the planar graphs, is it also, does a lower bound for kernelization also work there on planar graphs? Yes. Uh, so it does not have a polynomial kernel, but it has a Turing kernel in a real Turing sense. So, please come forward with your open problem. I'll, yes, Mike. Okay. Yeah, please come. So it, it, kind of, it, kind of, the comment, it kind of fits with what Safi was just pointing to your research directions and kernelization. Um, and even, even what he was last discussing. So, um, so how many people in the room have written grant proposals where we're looking for something? We're we're looking for. The mathematical keys to efficient pre-processing. Now <laughs> Pre-processing is so important to practical computing. This is a deadly um, rhetorical line for funding agencies. And you, how many people have gotten money for this? 
Oh, that's seriously, Bart, you, me? Anybody else got money for using that what I'm studying in kernelization is pre-processing? Pre-processing is enormously important in practical computing. I only said theoretically. Oh, here's Fedor, okay. Anybody else? Anybody written a grant proposal that didn't make it, but <laughs> used the same rhetorical line? It's potent, and it's right on. But this is what's been going on. We have, uh, you know, we get this, this, uh, guess what it is, and here's a crowd down here. Lots of them. And <laughs> we're looking at over here at many one kernelization. We have a whole bunch of interesting tools. And then somebody comes along and says, oh, you've, you've lost your keys, the, the mathematical keys to efficient pre-processing. Why, why are you guys looking over here? And the answer is, well, because there's a light. Is that where you lost your keys? Well, no, because if you think about it for five seconds, nobody in practical computing cares about anything except Turing kernelization. Turing kernelization, perfectly practical, and there's very little going on over here. Everybody's over here worrying about many one kernelization. So this, that's hardly explored at all. There's a little paper by Initial paper by Hermelin and company. Hermelin, who, who are the others? Anyway, it's in the book. <laughs> so that's, that's a very interesting research direction, and it has a history, which is slightly interesting and kind of comes back to where Socket ended up. There must be a bigger piece of chalk here somewhere um, about K-Path. So at the very first Dagstuhl, really, the very first Dagstuhl at the problem session where the matter of polynomial kernels was first discussed, at the very same Dagstuhl, the next day, we get on a bus to go on the outing. And Yi Jia Chen and, and um, Flum, Jörg Flum said, oh, we have a lower bound. And it was for the problem of rooted K path. And I vividly remember sitting next to them on the bus, and they uh, described this little, a very cute little result, which I couldn't remember the other day because I, I misremem misremembered the problem. So what's the difference between rooted k-path and just k-path? Well, I've got a graph. In rooted k-path, I also give you a vertex. And I say, well, is there a k-path that starts at, at the vertex u? As opposed to, is there a k-path starting anywhere? Well. Um, what's the relationship between k-path and rooted k-path? There's an obvious Turing reduction from k-path to rooted k-path. If there is k-path, it has to start somewhere. So I'll go to n different instances of rooted k-path, trivially. And their argument, which is very interesting, um, I don't know if they've published it. Somebody who's a better scholar can yell out. Um, there's no many one. So there's kind of interesting interplays between many one kernelization and polynomial and Turing kernelization, polynomial Turing kernelization. Um, kernel for rooted K path unless now here's the thing that kind of bugs me sometimes about the, so far in the kernelization literature. People will say, there's no poly, poly K kernel 
many one poly K kernel S, something weird happens. It's not weird at all. Um, and I'll give a little background about that, unless there's too much information compression. Anyway, we obviously have a Turing reduction from K path to rooted K path. And their theorem is there's no many one kernel for rooted K path unless this is um, Flum and Chen, Chen and Flum, e.g. a Chen and your Flum. I don't know if they've ever published it. Yeah, actually, sorry, may I, may I interrupt? Um, sorry, uh, that was published in 2011, as far as I understand. It was published in, at CIE in uh, 2009, and then in, uh, I think, Zero Computing uh, Systems in 2011, together with Müller, uh, Müller was also on the paper. Okay, good. 2009, and when was that DAG stool where we were first discussing polynomial kernels? Was that 2008 or seven? It must be something like that, yes. Seven, yeah, seven or eight. Okay, unless um, P is not equal to NP. Well, that's kind of fun that they have a consequence which is uh, worse than blah, blah, blah. Polynomial hierarchy collapses to the third level. Co-NP contained an NP slash poly, which should not be regarded as a weird hypothesis. And I'll explain about that over oh, here. Okay, now the way this works is really, really cute, and it can be told to you on a bus while you're heading off to go on the outing. And it repeats two phases. So we're given, um, and it, we'll call it the squishy argument. It repeats two phases, so phase one and phase two. So I start off with rooted K path. I've got this instance, right? So if I have a P time, a P time and proper, I don't know what you call it these days. In the beginning, Downey and Fellows said K prime is always at most K. Later it got relaxed to polynomial in K, which is K. But where there, if there is a, and I guess you, you probably have to put that adjective here if that's the modern vernacular for these things, where K goes down, as it should, because we're selling this to people in funding agencies who want to hear about the quest to find the missing mathematical keys to efficient pre-processing. Well, if K blows up, K is the source of all the problems. Why do they want to fund, send you money if the parameter which contains this exponential explosion gets bigger? Now I'm arguing with a few old people in the audience about the definition of kernelization in FPT, like Stano, for example, but anyway. In this first phase, we're assuming we have a kernelization, many one, where k goes, k prime is at most k. So the parameter does not blow up, it just gets smaller or stays the same while we do this preprocessing. Okay, so then what? Well, then I've gone from here to a new picture. And the size of this thing, which is this is our G, this is our G prime, this many one kernel, and I have my place that I start. And I have the length, and I have that this K prime now is at most K. Hope I'm not writing too small. And this whole thing is bounded by some function of K. Now the thing is. We have to get to P, to contradict this, we have to get to P equal to NP, right? And long path is NP hard. So we have to entertain the possibility that K is, K is huge. It's, it's a square root of N, or, you know, N to the two thirds. We have to deal with any kind of K in time polynomial in K. So far, so good, because we're polynomial and everything in sight. We go down to here. And um, now, if I have at this rooted vertex, I have a path of length k, well then, 
in my graph, it could go, oh, I have to start at the specified vertex and I have to go somewhere. And then I have to go somewhere else. Now there might be two different ways to get there, etc. Right. And now I'll I'll can squish. Squish this thing and say, well, I'll just figure out all of these different ways to start. And and how many are there? Well it's it's at most however many vertices squared. All right. And then I'll just squish it all together. I'll take, well, okay, I went here and then I went there, and then I would end up with this much left to find the rest of it. And this, and if I went this way, I'd have something left. Complete, just calculate it separately. Then I take all of these guys and this is phase two. This is the squish. Right, for taking all these two steps and then the, whatever's left, where I have to find one less, <laughs> squish to something, and now I'm worried about k minus one. But this is all polynomial in n and k to squish. Then I come here and let's repeat this. So k keeps going down. And now I've solved Hamiltonian path. Turing, though. So as an open problem, we can, in fact, sometimes get lower bounds, which are not based on this weird thing that happens, which is not weird, but rather p not equal to np. That's interesting. And then in general, this reduction from k path to root of k path is Turing. And I'm telling you, the funding agencies are buying this line and showering us worldwide with money. But if we don't produce anything useful from our study of pre-processing based on parameterization, they will stop sending the money. Duh. We know next to nothing about Turing kernelization. I'm giving you a little speech advocating that we give this more attention because it's a little bit more realistic in terms of practical importance. And let's, you know, this happens all the time. People are looking for the lost keys underneath the lamppost because it happens to be some light there. Okay. I, I have some other stuff, but I'll save it for later. Which is also not really my problem, uh, but we are trading other people. So, uh, have our favorite. We have our favorite uh, problem, namely connected vertex cover. I'm not going to define it. Uh, give you a graph G, integer k. Does the graph have a vertex cover of size at most k that happens to induce a connected graph? Uh, well, where the solution induces a connected graph, right? So uh, what we know is no polykernel uh, kernel, uh, many one polykernel, uh, unless the dot 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 
Cohen P, not a subset of NP slash poly. Uh, and furthermore, uh, it is complete, if I remember correctly, for WK1. And this is this paper of Crotch, Wallström, and Hermelin, and a bunch of other people that unfortunately, yeah, well, Wallström is also among those, so that's the same person. But uh, yeah, there, 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 it's like a several author paper, and unfortunately, I don't remember all of them. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a really cute class uh, where if you read the paper, it's sort of believable uh, that yes, uh, any problem that is complete for WK1 uh, does not have a polynomial Turing kernel even, okay? And my open, so, and so I don't want to define WK1. Honestly, I don't really remember the definition myself. But here is an equivalent definition, right? It's, ev it's everything that is equivalent under uh, polynomial parameter transformations to connected vertex cover, right? because it's complete for this, uh, because it is complete for this class. Is it many one transformation or, or a Turing transformation? Mike? It should be Turing, right? Because Turing kernels are closed under Turing transformations. I think that in the original publication it was a carp, it was a reduction. But, but it, you should... Meaning formally they defined using okay. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but of course it transferred hardness yes. of Turing kernels. Yes, okay, good. So now the open problem is sort of obvious and this is that show that connected vertex cover uh, does not have a, Turing, a polynomial Turing kernel. So I'm going, just going to write PTK for simplicity. Okay, I'm going to use one of these giant, oh god, there's actually a small chalk over here. N not one of those giant color ones. There we go. PTK, so polynomial Turing kernel. Okay? Assuming dot, 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 and now I'm going to define to you what dot, dot, dot means. Okay, so dot, dot, dot is any complexity theoretic assumption that you don't define in that same paper. And of course it's not allowed to be that like every problem in WK1 does not have a polynomial. So, so, so any assumption that is not, unless every problem in WK1 uh, admits a polynomial kernel and an assumption that you define in, in, in that paper as well, uh, anything goes, right? So, so just prove that connected vertex cover does not have a polynomial Turing kernel under any other assumption. If it's known that the assumption is true, then this doesn't count, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can replace here connected vertex cover with any other WK1. Yes, of course. I mean, it, it's so, so the reason I'm talking about connected vertex cover is just because I don't want to define that. Yeah, I right. think another WK1 complete problem, which is also very nice to discuss, is multicolor k where the first vertex needs to be of the first color, the second of the second, and so on. So this is WK1 complete. Yes, and and also uh, I think and also. Turing machine accept like short Turing machine acceptance when the Turing machine has a binary alphabet, uh, for example, uh, which which might be the hardest WK one complete problem, and therefore the easiest one to prove hardness of. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, you get my point. Just find me a new assumption. Okay. Maybe you would have jumped. <laughs> so, 
So to stick to the theme of churn kernelization and to fit to Mike's metaphor, let me try to light a candle uh, somewhere over here that deals with churn kernelization not from the prove it's impossible point of view, but try to find some spots where maybe there is something non trivial that you can do. And as was pointed out, um, it's wide open whether K path on general graphs has a polynomial churn kernel. Now, that is a tough nut to crack, which I think I get to say because I tried for a bunch of years. But um, I can point to places that I think might be plausible um, starting points for further attack for people who are willing to invest the time. So the main ingredient in the um, Turing kernel for finding a k-path on planar graphs is the fact that you can decompose a planar graph, or in fact any graph, into its three connected components. This is touch decomposition. So if you have your planar graph, then you can make a tree decomposition of it into bags, such that adjacent bags intersect in at most two vertices, and such that if you look at the graph induced by such a bag, and you add edges between the intersection points, then you get what's called the torso of the back, then this thing is a three connected graph. So you can decompose any graph into um, a tree decomposition whose torsos are three connected. And if you combine this with the known fact that a three connected planar graph is guaranteed to have a long cycle, um, then you get some strategy for attacking this problem. So what you do is you take your planar graph, you compute this decomposition into three connected components, and if you plug in known graph theoretical statements, then you immediately get that if there is a bag that has size, say, uh, k cubed, then you already know the answer is yes. Because if there is a three connected minor of your graph on k cubed vertices, existing graph theory tells you there is a cycle on at least k vertices. So in particular, there's a simple path. And after you know this, you get to work on this tree decomposition of your graph, which has constant adhesion and in which all the bags have size polynomial in k. So that if you get to communicate with an oracle um, and ask it questions of size poly k, then you get to ask questions that involve a bunch of these bags uh, at the same time, and then you can use this to set up uh, a reduction rule. So that's what works on planar graphs, and in general graphs, it's not true, but there's also simpler settings in which it's not true. And a nice um, place maybe to start uh, extending these techniques is to look at the k-path problem, on cardinal graphs. So it's known that if you have a planar three connected graph, then it has a simple cycle of length, say, k to the one third. But if you have a chordal three connected graph, you cannot guarantee that it has a very long cycle. Its longest cycle or longest path even may just be of logarithmic size. And in particular, if you take a complete binary tree, with, um, say, log n levels, so with n nodes, then the longest path in this tree is going to have length 2 log n. Of course, this is not yet a three-connected graph, but now if I add, say, two vertices that are adjacent to each other and everything else, then this becomes a three-connected chordal graph whose longest path still only has length order log n. Uh, and that's why if you try to run this scheme, uh, you get stuck because you can only conclude that there is a k-path if one of these bags has size exponential in k, and that doesn't get you to a polynomial term kernel. So this is, to me, the simplest setting uh, in which the existing Turing kernel machinery doesn't work, and if you wanted to attack uh, Turing kernelization for k-path, this might be uh, an interesting place to start um, that's not as hard as the general setting. Now, if you prefer to work on planar graphs instead, then there's also questions about planar Turing kernels, and you could look at
one of these two variations. One is to solve the problem of finding a simple path in your planar graph that is induced. Um, and the other is to find a cycle that has exactly k vertices. And the place in the existing scheme where this fails is if you find a large three connected component, then graph theory tells you, yes, there is a long cycle, but the cycle may be longer than k, and you might not be able to trim it down to size exactly k, and this cycle you find might not be induced. Right. So. At those places, the existing framework breaks down, and it would be interesting to see if you can resolve it to make sure in kernels there. Questions? All right. Yes, Maybe one remark. I think I can even agree from uh, this side. So m most people in this room know that vertex covers one of our favorites in uh, many ways uh, in, in uh, parameter complexity. And um, uh, so uh, it was already mentioned that the connected vertex cover might be some interesting candidate for some uh, problems arrayed uh, in context uh, or in connection with. with um, Current kernels, but there is also another modification where well, right, there's actually a um, uh, known uh, sort of non existing uh, poly uh, Turing kernels. Um, namely, um, if you uh, are uh, interested, uh, interested in the question whether uh, in your given graph there exists uh, a, um, a, a connected component that contains a vertex cover of size k for this connected con con component. You understand what I mean? No, I uh, didn't get the definition. What is okay, so we need it then. Sorry. It's kind of a trick how you can get non. Po uh, sorry. Hmm. Well, sorry, I'm bad at this. Thanks. Um, sorry, uh, it's like a like of a funny tr uh, like a funny trick how you can get uh, problems uh, out of classical problems uh, that uh, allow for no poly sized Turing kernels. If you uh, play the same tricks as Mike explained uh, with a, a, a longest longest path problem, uh, so uh, we we call it at some point of time. Um, MCA like multi-component, um, and I even don't know what the A meant uh, meant to be. Uh, but uh, variants of vertex cover say, oh, any any of your favorite problems you like uh, to have, where you basically ask. So given your graph, um, given does there exist, and of course your parameter k, uh, does there exist a connected component? G prime in G such that uh, there exist a, a set C of your of the vertex set of G prime uh, such that C is at most K and uh, C is the vertex cover of uh, G prime. You get it? So you are, you are looking for a connecting component within your graph that has a vertex cover of size k. And this is um, trivially FPT. I mean, uh, just whatever you uh, know about your FPT business in, in uh, general graphs applies to this variation as well. But it has no Turing kernel, uh, poly Turing kernel, um, by the same techniques as, as Mike uh, um, explained. Okay, strict strict kernels or proper kernels, whatever you call it. Um, so, and you can plug in uh, your, basically your uh, favorite problem. You, uh, it not, need not be vertex cover. It's just this kind of strategy you can, can play with. I just want to mention it because it was somehow um, on the table that, uh, okay, maybe vertex cover variants and uh, Turing kernels and stuff like that. So that's uh, all I wanted to say. So therefore, I thought I could do it from, 
from the other side. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, but uh, Mike, thanks for mentioning it. So it was kind of lost, this kind of um, scenario with this um, uh, Turing kernels based on, on this um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, technique. And uh, so la last year we also had a CIE paper, like 10 years after or nine years after uh, Müller and, and uh, Chen and, and uh, Flum had it. Uh, so. Uh, in this direction, so uh, there's no really a whole list of pay, uh, of problems which do not admit, admit uh, strict poly kernels, uh, uh, Turing kernels. So it's not just a but single one. Is it empty? Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's the whole machinery uh, going on. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so um, sorry. Um. Saki, can I mention an open problem? And yeah, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Daniel asked for some, he wants more hypotheses. Because the game's wide open now. There's all kinds of hypotheses running around. You know, in the olden days, it was not true. It suddenly became OK. But there was, um, if you're into the history of the field and the history of mathematics, um, the, the guy who had a really incredibly modern point of view on this stuff very early was Harvey Friedman, the logician at Ohio State. And his view was, you know, we don't really know what we're up to in mathematics. He said, the real game is what implies what. And we do know this is great mystery about our favorite lab animal, vertex cover. We know that in polynomial time, the vertex cover. Let us sing the praises of this wonderful problem. Perhaps the most important of the NP complete problems because it models conflict resolution. And there's conflicts in data. There's conflicts of all kinds. This one's super size. The problems in the back of Gary and Johnson are not created equal. This one's huge. Anyway. We know that in, um, just for a reference point, in P time, you know, we can take our G, K, and we can reduce it to G prime, K prime, less or equal to K. And this guy has, um, maximum degree three. Oh, in fact, so let's see, what, what kind of time is this? Well, it's probably n squared. Let's pretend. Doesn't matter. But we actually know in p time, we know reduction rules that'll take us Sorry, I didn't mean maximum degree. It's so, it's so easy to get confused between minimum degree and maximum. Minimum degree three. Every vertex has degree at least three. And we can get rid of all the degree three vertices with p time reduction rules. And we can get to minimum degree four. And then you wonder. Well, how f far can we go? Can we get to minimum degree five? And Lars Jaffke put in a huge amount of effort cleaning up this literature, which is very scattered and incomplete and had some bugs in it from various dissertations. Um, um, but anyway, it's now the picture's clean, brand new paper from last year. And we know we can almost get to minimum degree five. There's like two cases, right, Lars? Is it two cases or four? Uh, two. two cases left. And if we could resolve those, 
then in p time, we could get to minimum degree 5. Now, let's just um, I'll put an if here. Let's just pretend that this was order of n squared, and this is order, maybe this is order n to the fourth. It's not, but suppose this was order n to the tenth that got us to minimum degree five, and then to get to minimum degree six. Imagine we could do this. And, and that takes us order of n to the 600, and then, you know, n to the six million to get to minimum degree seven, etc. But what do we know? Can this, could this, could we have a scenario like this that goes on forever? We're paying more and more in terms of polynomial in n to get to this, our treasured minimum degree, all right? Some function of the minimum degree we have to pay in the exponent of the polynomial time kernelization, many one. How do you ensure that you don't cheat? Okay, fine. Because the correlation needs to be strict. You can't increase the parameter. Yeah, but that's fine. I add a universal vertex. Is it vertex cover or not vertex cover? Yeah. Vertex yeah. cover. Yeah, okay. If you add an affix, you increase by one. Yeah. All right, we should be able to, we should still be able to cheat. No, but you're, you're, you're playing with the K. <laughs> I'm just using the, the original definition of kernelization where K prime is the most K. Um, that's a key point about the difference in these definitions, perhaps. But could this, it's a strict kernelization or whatever you want to call it. What do people call this now, experts here? Strict? Strict, strict okay. It's not called Downey Fellows. <laughs> Our definition was k prime less or equal to k. But anyway, could this go on forever? And we know the answer is um, not, not unless ETH fails. So in other words, there has to be some minimum degree barrier where there is no polynomial time algorithm. Let's set, pretend the barrier is 11. There's no polynomial time algorithm to take your graph to minimum degree 11 for vertex cover with k prime less than or equal to k. So there's this mysterious barrier constant about the minimum degree for vertex cover kernelization. We have no quantitative information about it. So the open problem number one is quantitative information about, well, let's just call this minimum degree barrier constant for vertex cover any quantitative info. Lower bound. And how would you prove it? Well, you, maybe you could prove that if you could, if you had a polynomial time algorithm to get you to minimum degree 10, then you could use it some way cleverly to get you to 11 and it would collapse on up. Something like that, maybe. But on the other hand, this seems to be a very difficult problem. So here is question number two, which gets to Daniel's request for um, other hypotheses, game open, according to Harvey. See, according to ETH, there exists a barrier constant for p-time kernelization for vertex cover. In, when we're referring to minimum degree. 
Maybe it's 11. Is it possible that the existence of the barrier constant for minimum degree kernelization vertex cover implies ETH or is otherwise interesting? And then, of course, there would be a Turing version. Anyone else? Oh, I have lots of, so don't worry. So come. So if you will know, if you, do you know that the open problem session goes till 6 p.m.? So I have to fill two hours. <laughs> yeah. No, there's a half an hour break in between. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll try to give two problems so that the job of Socket is a bit easier. Thank you. Filling here the time. Uh, good. Uh, which board can I remove? I guess. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So the first one is actually an appendix to something that Socket said in the very beginning, uh, in this first list of problems. Namely, he pointed out the problem of uh, edge deletion. to flow free. Yes, and as, as, uh, as discussed, uh, this edge deletion problems in, in, in here when we are going to a uh, class that is characterized by forbidden induced subgraphs, they behave very differently from vertex deletion because in the vertex deletion you can have sunflower uh, kind of tools and you always have a polynomial kernel, but what happens with edge deletion or edge completion or editing, essentially, for example, take this graph. Yes, you see a claw here, and maybe you are tempted to kill it by removing this edge, but then you see another claw appearing, so you can still need to still kill it and so on and so on. So you have sort of propagation of obstacles. Yes? And if you think about edge deletion, maybe not to claw free graphs, but to any hereditary graph class, for example, edge free graphs. Where edge is some fixed forbidden induced subgraph, then there is a quite a large already body of work trying to see for what graphs edge this can be this can be done. And in particular, CLO is one of the main remaining cases that avoids uh, classification so far. And the experience is that mostly we are able to get good uh, positive results for kernelization whenever for this class here, yes, we have a good structural understanding. For example, you have some structural decomposition. And uh, this happened, for example, for trivially perfect graphs. This may happen for interval graphs, for example, if interval completion has a polynomial kernel. Um, and why we are so focused here on clo free graphs? Because there is this deep theorem of Chudnovsky and Seymour that gives a structural decomposition of every clo free graph into pieces that are like proper interval graphs or proper circular R graphs and so on that are somehow connected, fusified a little bit, but, but you can get some structure there, yes? And this decomposition of clo-free graphs sort of has a trivial, uh, trivial mapping when we are talking about line graphs and not, uh, not clo-free graphs. Essentially there, the overall decomposition is like a line graph where instead of sim single vertices, you can put arbitrary larger graphs, for example, proper interval graphs. So then my question is about, instead of focusing first on edge deletion to claw free graphs, what about edge deletion to a line graph? Yes, so you are you want to delete k edges from a graph to get a line graph, yes? And sort of the reason uh, I ask this question is that I believe that this might be a good route to trying to understand this question, 
Yes, because here you have a simpler decomposition. And you need to understand what happens in this decomposition in order to start to understanding what happens in this decomposition. So a few years back, uh, together with, uh, with my brother, together with Eric Jan, and together with Marcin Wiochna, and I think Marek Zygan as well was on the team, we were uh, looking at clo-free, diamond-free graphs, so clo-diamond-free. And the reason why we focus on this case is because clo diamond free graphs are exactly line graphs of triangle free graphs, for which we had a very good structural understanding. Yes? And we somehow could not leave it to line graphs, and this way I ask this question. So, does this have a polycarn? Okay, good. So, this was question number one from me. Then there's question number two. And I don't know how many times I already gave this question, but I think it's, uh, it's still uh, something that puzzles me. So a few years back, we had this problem, um, this, this paper about planar Steiner tree. So here you've got a graph. Yes, you've got terminals. And you want to find the smallest tree that connects all the terminals, right? And here the parameter k is the budget for the size of the tree. Yeah? Usually, you can also parameter by the number of terminals. Here we are just uh, parameters by the size of the tree. And what we managed to prove is that this problem Planar Steiner tree has a kernel of size order of k to 142. So I guess that given this number 142, there is an obvious open question what this uh, number should really be. Yes? So this 142 came from some sort of recurrence in, in here. And let me try to distill this question, whether this 142 could be, could be improved, to a very... Yes? How carefully we compute 1 for 2? It's actually some irrational number is a little bit lower than 142. We did not optimize the, 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 the recursion. Yeah, probably we could say, like, push it a little bit, I don't know, to k to 60 or something like that, but there's no point in a sense. 60. Maybe k to 60. I don't know. It's, so essentially, this number comes from a recursion, yes? And the better parameters we have in this recursion, the better exponent we have here, yes? So if by some case analysis, we are able to, to, to get, I don't know, 1 over 30, <laughs> some or a parameter instead of 1 over 60, then immediately this drops. Yes, but I don't believe that with the current understanding we can get below k to 10, for instance. Okay, so let me try to distill a purely graph theoretical question here. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I will manage here. Imagine you've got a planar graph that looks like this. That means that the outer face of this planar graph is just a cycle of length k. Okay. Right? And imagine that this, here you've got uh, some very complicated graph inside. Right? And somebody comes to you and asks you, here is a terminal, here is a terminal, here is a terminal, here is a terminal. What is the optimum Steiner tree that connects those terminals? Yes? Inside this graph. Surely there will be one of length at most k, because I can buy the whole boundary, right? But maybe there will be better inside. Something like that. Yes? And then this person comes to you again and asks you for another set of terminals. And so on and so on. Yes? So now you want to prepare yourself for every possible question. In the following sense, you want to find a subgraph of the stuff inside with the smallest number, with the smallest possible number of edges, such that for every question you can ask about a subset of the boundary, yes, 
terminals on the on, on the boundary, you will you will find some optimum Steiner tree within. Yes? So the question is find as small h that is a subgraph of G such that for every choice of terminals some optimum tree is preserved. Yes? So the obvious bound, how many edges I need to keep in such a subgraph, is something like 2 power k, or rather k times 2 power k. Because I've got 2 power k possible questions. For each of them, I mark some optimum Steiner tree. It has length at most k. I've got k times 2 to the k many edges preserved. Right? So what actually happens in this paper, the key, the key combinatorial part is proving that I can find h of size this. Yes? But the best example of a lower bound here is that we know of is just k square. And it looks as follows. I just take a grid of side length k over 4 so that the boundary has length k, yes? And then if I ask about two guys like here, the shortest connection is here, so I need to preserve this in my, in my subgraph. And if I ask about two guys here, the best signer tree connecting them is just the, the column, yes? So I need to preserve all the columns and all the rows in such a sparsifier, yes? And we know of no better example than k-square. Yeah? And that's a purely combinatorial graph your question. Yes? You've got a planar graph with k vertices on the boundary. What is the best possible size of a sparsifier, sparsifier in this sense? Yes? So any reasonably better upper bound or any even lower bound higher than k-square would be highly appreciated for this question. Good. Can I add something? Yep. Um, I was going to ask a, a similar question. What is very special here is indeed that these two to the k different questions that can come, you can encode uh, something that stores all of their answers in size poly k. And here this happens for Steiner tree. But there's two other types of objects, and there's actually many more types of objects where you can ask yourself, can you encode all of the answers to these exponentially many questions in a small object? And I can give two examples. One question is, I give you a pairing of terminals on the boundary, and I ask you, is there a system of disjoint paths that connects these, path, uh, these pairs that I give you? Obviously, buying the entire boundary will work, because since they're on the outer face, they have to be non-crossing so that the boundary does it. But maybe you can be shorter if you go inside. And another uh, question is, if instead of a Steiner tree, you want to preserve that any pair of terminals is connected by two internally vertex disjoint paths. Then again, the entire boundary will do it, uh, but maybe you can be cheaper on the inside. But there you have some polynomial upper bounds at all, or? No, I don't okay. Okay. okay, so it's 15.25, so let's take a break now, and we'll come back at four o'clock. So there's a tea and some snacks there, so. Okay, so let's take a break, and we'll come back at four o'clock for more.